tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friends. Welcome back to Casa de Blood. And for all you folks who are entertained by my host segments every week, thank you for being part of the family. For those who don't, Maybe you missed a sign right on my door here. See that? No timestamps allowed. I know it, Chester. Some folks just show up at dinner time and leave right after dessert. Well, forget them. Come on in, everyone. Let's do a little pre-gaming. Mm. Huh? Man, do you ever buy a pack of your own? All right, here you go. That's better, huh? So tonight, we welcome a new friend to the show, author of the Reflections in the Abyss anthologies and Nightmares of the Damned, Frederick Pangborn. So smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, damn it, because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigamarole. Uh, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu. Sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole enchilada, including hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating all the way back to 2012. Thank you for your support. Got a story or two you'd like to hear on the show? Send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, we'll do business. All right, tonight we visit the Windward Inn, a nice little bed and breakfast where an unwanted guest has been squatting rent-free. So, without further delay, I give you from author Frederick Pangborn, Dead Storage. Jonathan? Angie stuck her head in the kitchen and scanned the room until she spotted me pulling a small sack of sugar from one of the shelves. Mrs. Resnick was looking for you. I think she wants you and Bob to take some stuff down to the dead storage. I sighed as I closed the upper cabinet door from where I pulled the sugar from and turned to face Angie. I'm kinda in the middle of something. Can't you and Bob take care of it? Before she even uttered a word, Angie Lieberman was shaking her head to my undemanding and simple request, her long curly brown hair swaying to the movement. I'm helping Mrs. Resnick with the filing, and lugging things into the basement is a man's job. Are you serious? I began, but her head had already disappeared from the inn's kitchen as suddenly as it had emerged, leaving me with my mouth open and alone. It wasn't like I hated lugging junk into the basement or into the dead storage room but it always seemed like they conjured these tasks up at the most unsuitable of times. It was bad enough that, being the cook here at the Windward Inn, I was still required to crawl around in a basement while I was in the middle of preparing food, and not to be aware of the numerous sanitary issues that it raised? Come on. Nevertheless, there was no one except Angie, Bob, and I here during this time of the year when it came to the staffing at the inn. Fall was already stretching into October and most of the guests had already checked out. The Windward Inn was a bed and breakfast owned by Bernie and Josephina Resnick. They had owned the inn since as long as I lived here in town, and I had been working for them for about four or five years now during the busy time of the year, which was pretty much from May until now when I wasn't attending culinary classes at the community college. The inn was situated at the edge of a town and was backed up to the lake. The location was perfect. It was the lake that drew in most of the out-of-towners and kept the town of Florence going with outside financial backings. Like I said, the inn's property stretched into the banks of the lake, and the scenic view of the sun rising and setting over the lake from inside the inn was spectacular. Breakfast from the dining room or out in the back deck at sunrise was something to be experienced, to be truly appreciated. I found myself on many occasions slacking in my duties and just leaning up against the window, enjoying the view. 
The inn is a large two-story Victorian building that was supposedly built back in the late 1800s and was, and still is, the most desirable place to reside in when staying here in Florence. The eight luxurious rooms here fill up fast during the tourist season, and I consider myself lucky at times that there are only eight rooms. It can get a bit hectic here at times, especially when help is minimal, and it's only Angie, Bob, and I scrambling around trying to maintain some type of order. The Resnicks are always here, and they try to lend a hand when they can, but they're close to their 80s now, so we don't expect them to take on too much of the chores here. Sighing, I untied my apron and tossed it on the counter. There was no sense in trying to start any bacon now, I had decided, and was about to walk out of the kitchen when Bob Goodman's head poked from around the corner. Hey, John, Mrs. Resnick wants us to... He began before I cut him off with a wave of my hand. Yeah, yeah, I know. Angie was just in here. What does she want us to move downstairs? Uh, some boxes with last year's files, detergent, and uh, two chairs for the dead room. Bob always referred to the dead storage room as the dead room for whatever reason. Perhaps it sounded like going down into a place called the dead room was like some undertaking that required only the bravest of volunteers. Or maybe it just sounded cool. Who knows? Bob started here at the end the season before last and was still trying to grasp the daily routines of working here. He was a nice guy, and everyone here took a real liking to him from the get-go. He was a year younger than Angie and I's 26, tall, thin, and wore glasses that always seemed to slide from his face. We left the kitchen area and walked through the adjoining dining room, through the lobby, and halted at the front desk where Angie was sitting behind, typing away at the computer. Despite having a computer to do all the filing for the end, the Resnicks were firm believers in having those files in black and white as well. Something you could hold in your hand and not data in a thumb drive. So where's this stuff going downstairs? I asked. Without pulling her eyes from the screen, she pointed to the door to the office behind her. In the office. Gotcha, I replied with as much enthusiasm that I could muster. And Bob and I walked around the desk counter and into the back office. The office was comprised of two cluttered desks, one for Bernie and the other for his wife, a few mixed-matched filing cabinets, an old General Electric refrigerator, and a small table with a stained coffee maker with cups and assorted condiments lining its surface. Sitting on the floor next to the door to the basement were three cardboard boxes identified by a black marker as 2005 files, a 50-pound plastic bucket of lemon-scented detergent powder, and one of the old office chairs with a white piece of paper taped to its back stating dead storage in the same black marker. I'll take the chair and you grab the detergent. We'll come back up for the files, I said as I opened the basement door and turned on the light switch. The basement was a foundation of large stones and ancient mortar. With the rust-coated pipes running along the ceiling, you had to duck your head in certain areas to avoid a nasty lump on the noggin. Bob can attest to that, as he wasn't a fast learner when navigating his way down here, and found out the hard way, on a few occasions. The right wall was lined with shelves where supplies and boxes of dust-covered files from the previous years rested. A wall of sheetrock was constructed at the far end to accommodate the laundry room. Two large front-loader washers and dryers sat back there, and we all took turns on the laundry detail, including Angie. With her fear of being down here, though, she mostly persuaded Bob or myself to switch chores. I didn't mind. With the poor lighting down here from bulbs of less wattage than required and a constant chilled dampness, I could see Angie's displeasure of being down here alone. It reminded me of some medieval dungeon. It didn't bother me, though. I'd throw on my headset and fold laundry for hours, enjoying the peaceful bliss to some classic rock. To the left was the door to the dead storage. I was in the process of opening the door when Bob was walking back from placing the detergent in the laundry room. Think there's room in there for that? Bob asked, gesturing to the door. Last time I was in there, the dead room was packed. Well, either way, it's going in, I replied as I opened the door and groped for the light switch on the wall inside. 
The dead room didn't have a light in the ceiling like most rooms. Instead, an old floor lamp that used to sit in the lobby found its way down here years ago and was now the sole source of light. With the lamp only having one working socket out of the three, the light it cast was as dim as the basements. Before the lamp, we had to use a flashlight. Things were rough back then. My fingers fell upon the switch, and in an instant, the room was poorly illuminated. The lamp stood in the far corner, blocked by a discarded bed frame. The room, as Bob had stated, was packed to the gills. Everything from old furniture that the Resnicks refused to throw out to items left behind by former guests filled the room. A narrow path through this mess was left so we could make our way to the back of the room to stack junk upon more junk. I surveyed the layout of this order for the chair's final resting place. Told ya, Bob commented as he stood next to me and scanned the room with his hands on his hips. I rubbed my chin as my eyes moved from one pile of fittings to the next. Yeah, this place gets smaller and smaller every time I come in here. As I tried to determine a suitable spot for the chair, Bob had casually moved down the narrow path to the back of the room, touching and inspecting various items as he went, like a collector in an antique show. It wasn't until he was at the back of the room that something had caught his attention and caused him to stop and bend down. I don't recall seeing this before. He stated more to himself, but was intended for me to acknowledge. I blocked any acknowledgement until he spoke again. Yeah, hear me, John. You ever seen this trunk before? I sighed and made my way through the tight passageway to where he was kneeling. Before I was at his side, he was already pulling the trunk from beneath the table from where it was hidden. It was a large wooden trunk whose worn faded leather exterior was torn in several places, exposing the birch wood underneath. It had to be about 20 inches high and covered by dust. There's a guest tag name on it, I said and pointed to the faded yellow tag that was tied to the trunk's padlock. Bob wiped the dust from his hands on his pant legs and lifted the tag so he could read its inscription. It says, Room Number 8, Malloy, 1986. 1986? Wow! I can't believe it's been down here that long, I replied. Bob dropped the tag and was now examining the primitive padlock that secured the trunk. It's kind of heavy. I wonder what's inside. If no one has claimed it by now, chances are they never will, right? I suppose not. Why? I'm going to try to open it. Who knows what's inside this thing? He was now pulling at the lock. Well, I tell you what, why don't you put the chair up when you're done and I'll go bring the files down, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, he replied, not fully grasping what I had just suggested. He was now pulling a red pocket knife from his back pocket and unfolding the blade, his undivided attention fixed on the lock. Okay, then. I'll leave you to that, I said, and made my way back to the front of the room. I had some baking to do, and this was throwing a wrench in my schedule. I had taken the boxes of files down one at a time and slid them onto the shelves in their periodic order next to their older brethren when I heard Bob call out from the dead room. John! I got the lock open. His voice was excited as the time he returned from watching Revenge of the Sith at the Florence Theater. Nice, I called back as I started making my way back up the stairs. Let me know if you find anything worth mentioning. I'm heading back up. There was no reply, so it was safe to assume he didn't hear me or was preoccupied with the contents of the old trunk. I shook my head and smiled as I climbed the stairs. Jonathan, where's Bob? <gasps> Angie's sudden voice scaring the bejesus out of me as I prepared to put a couple of apple pies in the oven. Jesus Christ, Ange! Are you trying to give me a heart attack? I closed the oven door and turned to face her. She stood leaning in the kitchen's doorway, smiling. The Resnicks are leaving and we're asking where Bob was. You saw him last. I checked my watch. It was 546. It was just after 2 when we took the stuff into the basement. He hasn't come up from the basement yet? You tell me. I was just giving you a heads up that the bosses were looking for him. Angie folded her arms across her chest and watched me, waiting for an answer. 
It was times like these that I usually reminded her she wasn't my boss, but decided to refrain from engaging in any pissing contest for the time being. Instead, I shook my head, hissed, and walked past her. Damn it, Bob, I thought as I walked through the end to the basement door. When I reached the office, I opened the basement door and peered down the stairs. The light downstairs was still on. Damn you, Bob. I descended the stairs heavily. Bob! What the hell, man? No response. When I reached the basement cement floor, I instantly noticed that the door to the dead storage was closed. I paused at the unexpected sight. I was sure that he would still be in there. Bob! I opened the door to find the lights were still on. The office chair with the paper dead storage taped to it stood exactly where I had left it three hours earlier. Bob? I stepped into the room and looked about. No sign of him. I threw a glance down the aisle and saw the trunk still out from under the table. The lid was closed and its lock laid on the floor nearby in the open position. Bob, I said aloud again, as if he was nearby and didn't hear me call for him initially. I shrugged, as any notion to his whereabouts were now discarded by the room being empty. It was as if he simply vanished or walked off without saying a word. Before I left, I maneuvered some of the furniture around and slid the office chair out of the way. I threw another glance at the trunk sitting alone at the end of the aisle and shrugged once more before turning off the light and leaving the room. Before going back up, I poked my head in the laundry room, just in case. Nothing. As I rounded the stairs back up to the office, Angie appeared in the doorway. Don't forget you have pies in the oven. Was he down there? I squeezed past her as I entered the office and checked my watch. I still had about 25 minutes before the pies needed to be pulled out. Well? She asked. Oh, no, he wasn't. It's like he just vanished. He was down there picking the lock on some old trunk he found down there when I left him. But that was like three hours ago. Well, the Resnick's left already, she said as she stared down the steps into the dark of the basement. We have two guests checking out. Mr. West is leaving in a few, and Ms. Rigney is the last to go tomorrow morning. Well, do me a favor and call up Ms. Rigney and see if she's going to be having dinner anytime soon. I'm going to close up the kitchen soon. Angie turned her gaze away from the basement stairs. What trunk? We were putting that chair in the dead room, and he found this trunk that belonged to some guest like 20 years ago. He was set on picking the lock and seeing what was inside. Well? Well what? What did he find in it? I shrugged. How should I know? I left while he was still picking it. I paused for a moment, thinking. What? I just remembered that the lock was laying on the floor when I just left there. And you didn't check to see what was inside? She inquired as if I was some child who should have known better than to stick my hand in an open flame. No, I... Jonathan, really? That trunk could have been filled with cash and Bob just loaded his pockets up and split. I, I didn't... Let's go look. Let me take the pies out of the oven first. Even though I doubt that the trunk was filled with cash, I'll agree with you that I probably should have seen what was in there, I said over my shoulder as we descended the stairs into the basement. Why else would he just take off? He probably found something in there that was valuable as hell and took it home. Though Angie's theory would explain why Bob had suddenly called it quits and left, she didn't know Bob like I did. He would have been too scared to just leave without saying a word to anyone, especially me. Angie? Sure. She had the usual tendency to be a little too bossy towards him. But me? He would have filled me in. Oh yeah, he most definitely would have. Watch your head, I advised her as she barely missed a low-hanging elbow joint. Did you ask Mrs. Rigby about dinner while I was getting the pies? I asked as I turned the doorknob to the dead storage and pushed it open. Shit, I forgot all about her. She'll be fine. Uh-huh. Famous last words. Again, I searched for the switch and the room once again illuminated in a dull yellowish glow. With Angie practically joined at my hip, I entered the room and pointed to the trunk at the far end of the aisle. There it is. Angie, finding a renewed courage of being in the basement, slid past me and crept to the trunk. 
She took a knee next to it and examined the guest tag. Malloy, 1986, she said aloud. She then turned to look at me, biting her lower lip as if to say, Wish me luck, here goes nothing. And with that, she turned her attention back to the trunk and slowly opened the lid. The lid fell aside on its hinges, exposing its contents within. I couldn't see from where I stood with Angie's back blocking my view, and I heard her gasp as she flinched backwards. I took a step closer when Angie fell backwards on her ass, giving me a full view now of what was inside. At first, I couldn't make heads or tails of what I was looking at. Something of a whitish color seemed to be crammed into the trunk, like linen and pillows. It looked like it was in pieces, whatever it was. Then it moved. A piece of it poked up from the trunk. Then another piece popped up as it seemed something inside was alive and now moving. As a larger piece of this form arose, it was evident that whatever had been inside this trunk was now unfolding itself as it laboriously pulled itself free from its cramped quarters. It froze me to the spot as I watched. Like some Lufkin folding ruler, it slowly opened up and developed into some type of humanoid shape that rose higher and higher from the restricted confines of the trunk. I felt Angie bump into my legs and looked down. She was attempting to scramble backwards like a crab from the nightmare emerging in front of us. It blocked the light from the lamp out, and I looked up to the shape that had risen from its container and was forming. The creature stood tall inside the trunk. Its head was now touching the ceiling, and it stooped as it continued to grow. The creature was of giant humanoid proportions. Its white leathery skin hung loosely from its elongated body, and its protruding rib cage was prominent beneath its skin, like that of a starved dog. Its limbs were thin and long, the hands, however, were overly large with long red talon-like fingers. The head was like a lengthened skull. Strands of long gray hair hung to its shoulders. Its lidless eyes large, bulbous, and black. Its mouth resembling that of some Venus flytrap. Its red teeth, long and pointed, were integrated as they jutted outward. It was as if my feet had been glued firmly to the floor. Even as I felt Angie pushing against my legs to get further away from the horror that was manifesting itself before our very eyes, my feet remained rooted, my legs unyielding. I felt my bladder shiver inside of me, and I hoped I wouldn't piss myself, not with Angie right there, not with the back of her head pressed against my crotch. The horror from the trunk nonchalantly reached out ever so carefully and grabbed Angie by her calf, its massive hands easily grabbing a firm hold around her leg. A whimper escaped her lips as it pulled her away from me. As she slid from my legs, she looked up to me, her eyes filled with tears, her lips quivering as she attempted to say my name. Her hands frantically reached out to me as she tried to grab onto me and my clothing as an anchor. Her fingers found no grip and slid from my pants. Like she was some child's doll, the horror lifted her in the air by her leg and held her dangling body in front of it. Still, Angie did not scream out. She only hung there upside down like some squirming worm impaled on a fisherman's hook. Her blouse fell over her head, exposing her bare torso and black lace bra. I opened my mouth. To say what, I have no idea, but I seemed so small and helpless at that moment. I stood rooted to the floor with fright as Angie was being taken by this nameless horror and I could do nothing to intervene. No shouts for help, no attempt to free her, nothing. The horror pulled her body close, embracing it like a child would a stuffed animal. Holding it close to its bosom, its long pale arms wrapped around her constricting flailing movements. It was then Angie bawled loudly and wailed. Jonathan! She cried out. The horror then extended its skull head out toward me and opened its gaping maw in a growl like hiss. As if to warn me that any rescue at this point was futile, 
and to back away from what now rightfully belonged to it. It was then that I uprooted my feet and my legs awakened from their paralysis. I turned and ran from the room with the sound of Angie's muffled cries as she called out my name behind me. I ran from that room in a blind panic, like someone fleeing from a burning movie theater, rushing to the nearest exit without concern for anything or anyone except the way out. It was in my hasty retreat for the stairs and back up to the office that the same elbow joint I had warned Angie about caught me square in the head and in an instance of blinding white, the room went black. My hearing was the first to awaken from my unfortunate and forced slumber. The surrounding voices were faint and distorted at first. I think he's waking up, said a woman's concerned voice. Can you hear me, kid? A man's voice now inquired. Before my eyes even opened, I felt the throbbing pain in my head. It reminded me of a tequila hangover I once had two years ago at Jimmy Doyle's party that had rendered me helpless for a day and a half. I went to reach for my forehead and I felt the soft hand block my own and gently guide it back to my side. You've had a nasty hit to the head. We took the liberty of calling an ambulance since no one else was around. The woman stated. My eyelids parted and the light immediately caused a bolt of pain to rack my skull. I moaned and tried to touch my forehead again, only to have it redirected to my side. You mustn't touch it, the woman said. As I slowly forced my eyes open and take in my surroundings, I realized that I was lying on the floor to the office upstairs. Standing at my feet was a tall man in his early fifties. He was dressed in a gray suit and his graying hair was slicked back over his head. He reminded me of the actor Christopher Lee. I then placed him as Mr. West in room number three. I came to check out and didn't find anyone about, West began. I then bumped into Ms. Rigney here, and we took it upon ourselves to look around for someone. It's a good thing we did. We found you knocked out cold on the basement floor. We guessed that you hit your head on one of the pipes down there in the ceiling. It was Rigney who now spoke. Do you remember hitting the pipe? Where's the other staff at? We looked all over the inn and couldn't find a soul. I turned to look at Ms. Rigney, who was kneeling at my head. The brightness of her flowered dress caused me to wince in pain, and I saw that the front of the dress was hanging open, granting me a full view of her ample C-cup breasts hanging inches from my face. Those voluptuous breasts momentarily caused me to forget why I was lying on the floor to begin with but now her beautiful cans were now being swept aside, and the image of that thing rising from the trunk came back to me all too vividly. Angie, I said, and tried to sit up. A wave of dizziness washed over me, and I felt a twinge of nausea. Rigney eased me back down to a folded in towel that had been placed under my head as a pillow. Who? She asked. I believe it's the young woman who works at the front desk, stated West. Where is everyone, kid? Laying in the prone position on my back, I raised my hand and pointed to the open basement door. It has her. The thing in dead storage took her. Thing? Asked Rigney. What thing? We saw no one else down there, added West. In dead storage. In the trunk, I said before closing my eyes with a moan. The nausea seemed to be getting worse, just like that tequila hangover. Perhaps he means that door on the left down there? Rigney said as she stood up and straightened her dress. West was already descending the stairs and Rigney followed. <sighs> Don't go in there. I weakly warned them as they were leaving the office. <laughs> it's in the trunk. Ms. Rigney paused and looked over her shoulder to me. You just lay there and try not to move. The ambulance will be here soon. We'll see if your friend is down there. And with that, the beautiful Ms. Rigney with her flowered dress and huge breasts disappeared down the basement stairs. There was nothing I could have done to stop them. I was physically too banged up to get on my feet and prevent them from going down there 
and my mind still wasn't at 100% to convince them of the horror that was awaiting them in the dead storage. What could I have possibly said? Don't go in there. There's this giant of a monster that lives in a trunk that's ten times too big for it to fit into. Yet it can and does. No, that would never do. Perhaps I had somehow imagined the whole ordeal. Perhaps when West and Rigney went down there, they would find Bob and Angie rummaging through some former guest's belongings, and all would be back as it was. I was persuading myself that what I saw down there in that room was not the truth, but some induced nightmare caused by the bump on my head. I had almost convinced myself that, until I heard the muffled screams from somewhere down in the basement. I could feel their blood-curdling cries for help vibrate up through the floor beneath me. They continued briefly for a moment, then fell silent as they had most likely met the same fate as Bob and Angie had. I pictured the horror reaching out and grabbing the two, lifting them up high and devouring them before it squirmed back into the tight quarters of its abode. I laid there on that office floor thinking of what that thing could possibly be and why it was in that trunk. Who was Malloy? And was that person even aware of what that trunk contained? I lay there staring at the stained tiled ceiling of that office until two paramedics entered the inn and found me here in the back room. When they asked where the people were who called in about my injury, I didn't bother trying to go through the whole spiel about Bob finding the trunk, or Angie opening it with me there, or even that Mr. West and Miss Rigney were now dead. Nah, why bother? I just pointed to the basement door and simply said, dead storage. One paramedic went down there a little while ago, and the other one is still dressing the wound on my head. It didn't take too long for that guy to find a trunk, because his scream started up and the other guy is leaving me now, and running down there to see what's going on. He will see it all right, and then some. Think I'll just lay here a bit longer until this nausea passes and get up and head back home and possibly convince myself that this blow to my head had caused me to hallucinate all of this. Maybe bust out a bottle of booze and hopefully wash everything away. There was no way I could sanely accept everything that happened today without going off the deep end permanently. No, I couldn't have that. Best to just drink myself blind and consider myself laid off and to never mention the events that took place in the dead storage room ever again, leaving the thing in the trunk to anyone else who makes the same mistake I did. And that was Dead Storage by Frederick Pangborn. A good reminder that people don't typically leave behind a trunk full of cash. Most of the time, you're either going to get a pile of crap or a monster. Let someone else open it is all I'm saying. A little about the author. Frederick Pangborn is an avid horror fan and a short story author who currently has five of his own anthologies in publication, along with numerous stories featured in magazines and other anthologies. Dead Storage can be found with many other stories of the macabre in his third book, Nightmares of the Damned. Originally from New Jersey, this former Marine and retired corrections officer now resides in Florida, where he continues to write and relax. Thanks, Frederick. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintellsfordarknights.com, 
where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, and if you're looking for a place to stay tonight, Bring along a black light. Lennons with a life of their own says to me they haven't been washed in a while. Food for thought. I'd like to say hi to a few friends of the show. Paul Ross, Thomas Humphreys, Patrick Forget, and Daniel Pumphrey. Oh, and how could I forget MC? Hey, Michelle. I appreciate the comments and support, y'all. It really means a lot to me. And though I don't always respond, I do read every comment. So just know that your message is getting through to me, y'all. Thank you. So without further ado, Paul Ross, Thomas Humphreys, Patrick Forget, Daniel Pumphrey, and Miss Michelle. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Keep your fingers out of funny boxes. And until next week, y'all go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.